Honorable colleagues, the third business of the day is presentation of report of the Hado Committee on, pre uh, on the gruesome murder of Nigerians by soldiers in Enugu. The report is ready for presentation. Honorable uh, Ablarim is here uh, invited to present his report. Your Excellency, Right Honorable Mr. Speaker, distinguished honorable colleagues, I hereby move that the sectoral debate on our service chief do commence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Deputy Speaker, our leaders, honorable colleagues, our invited uh, highly respected uh, chiefs, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Today marks a significant milestone in the implementation of our legislative agenda as we commence the sectoral debates of the 10th House of Representatives. This is the maiden edition of the debate, and I'm pleased we are commencing with the security sector. Our focus on security is immediately clear, given the unprecedented challenges of the past decade. Over the last few years, we have made significant progress in tackling insecurity through improved investment by the federal government and the gallantry and professionalism of our servicemen and women. I salute the courage of our armed forces and law enforcement personnel. May I ask all of us to stand and observe a minute silence for the gallant men and women who have made the ultimate sacrifice to defend our nation and those who have fallen victim to the pervasive insecurity in our land. May their soul rest in peace. heads of MDAs are required throughout the sectoral briefings. As such, the House shall not expect proxy, accept proxy representation for any reason whatsoever. Notices are sent well in advance to forestall any excuses. Dear colleagues, only a few days ago, I had the honor of unveiling and presenting the legislative agenda of the House to the public. An important component of the agenda is improving the quality of debates on the floor and engagement with the executive on critical issues of national interest. As representatives of the Nigerian people, it is our, it is our duty to ensure that policies and programs implemented by the executives are in line with the aspirations and needs of the citizens we all represent here in the People's House. The commencement of the sectoral debate with ministries, departments, and agencies once again demonstrates our dem determination to ensure that legislative measures and decisions are evidence-based and people-oriented. The sectoral briefs will provide those with an opportunity to scrutinize the policies activities and plans of each MDA. It will also allow the House and members to understand better the challenges facing government agencies, their programs, and areas for legislative interventions. Accordingly, we have developed a calendar for our planned engagement with the executive covering several thematic areas, including the economy, education, health, agriculture, infrastructure, and many others. These will be undertaken regularly throughout the life of the 10th Assembly. The debates are in line with our constitutionally assigned powers to make laws for the good governance of the Federation and to ensure that government programs and expenditures are in line with legislative intent. Therefore, the legislature must engage in constructive dialogue with senior government officials from all sectors to understand their operations, challenges, and legislative needs. Honorable colleagues, 
we made a conscious decision to commence the sectoral debates with the security sector, given that it is prioritized in our legislative agenda in section 14, 2, and B of the 1999 constitutions, as altered, declares that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. And in this declaration, the security and welfare of the people are conjunctively presented as a sole purpose. This session with the heads of security agencies is an important opportunity to brief the House on the progress made so far and other lingering challenges. Members will be able to ask questions on context specifics, on context specific issues. I will be given ample time to respond to these issues raised. Through this interaction, we aim to foster collaboration in tackling the multiple security challenges that confront us. I urge all members of this esteemed house to approach these briefings with an open mind and a commitment to serving our constituents and our country. Let us ask probing questions that seek clarity on legislations, policies, programs, and implementation strategies. Dear colleagues, let us approach these sectoral debates with a sense of purpose and responsibility. We must remember that our actions can potentially shape the future of our great nation. Together, we can build a prosperous, inclusive, and a just Nigeria. I encourage our security chiefs to be transparent and forthcoming in their presentations. We are encouraged to provide us with accurate and up-to-date information. Share your successes and acknowledge your challenges. We are here not to reprimand, but to understand you better, and by so doing, find long-lasting solutions to your problems. I thank our security chiefs for their willingness to participate in this phase of the sectoral debates. Your presence here today demonstrates your commitment to democracy and good governance. I assure you that the House of Representatives will provide a conducive environment for fruitful discussions and deliberations. Each of you will be given an initial 10 minutes to give an overview of your agency, its work, successes, challenges, and request to the House, and request to the House. Subsequently, the floor will be open for members to ask questions. Each member asking a question has two minutes for their questions, while five minutes is allocated for response. This is to allow for more members to participate. Members have an additional three minutes to ask follow-up questions. It is my pleasure, honorable colleagues, to invite the Chief of Defense Staff to introduce the team and guide the process. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I come under Order 6. Privilege. Mr. Speaker, the engagement we are having today is with the security structure of country Nigeria. And in the interest of the honorable members as well as their constituents and the interest of the gallant military and other agents of coercion in the field, I suggest that this kind of critical security issues to be discussed in an in-depth analysis on the floor of this House should be had in an executive session. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I am saying this not because of anything. It's simply because if we want to hear the truth and let the security chiefs hear the truth from honorable members as per information gathered from their various constituencies in Nigeria, and at the same time, for us not to do a TV show with the lives of Nigeria, there is a need for this session to be had in an executive session. I so move. Thank you, sir. If it is a sensitive area that they feel cannot be deliberated on the floor, 
they are liberty to tell us that this cannot be discussed here. But as representatives of the people, honorable colleagues, we, honorable colleagues, although let me explain to you. and they will have an engagement that will be done in executive session. Questions that cannot be answered in public, we will uh, do it in executive session. We are not saying that we will allow them to go spoke free without answering. But those that are too sensitive to be released here, and the executive session will be conveyed where so those questions will be asked and we expect them to answer. So your point of order is uh, noted, and uh, we will do that where we confirm that a certain question requires an executive session to be answered. Thank you, honorable colleagues. My name is General Christopher Gwabi Musa, the Chief of Defense Staff, Armed Forces of Nigeria. By the virtue of my appointment, I coordinate the activities of the armed forces together with all security agencies. Uh, let me start by firstly appreciating God Almighty for the opportunity to be here this morning, uh, for also appreciating the House for giving us the opportunity to be here. Uh, I wish to also state that uh, we on behalf of the security forces, regret the incidents of last week that were not able to be here in person. It was not on purpose, it was not personal. Uh, basically, because of the challenges we were having, most of us were not available, and that's why we felt it was since the date had been fixed, the chiefs of operations should attend. But we have taken correction, and we assure you of our dedication, commitment, to service and to the greatest respect to this hallowed chamber, that we know the relevance and the importance of the House of Reps. Your success is our success, and we will not ever take that for granted. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity, sir. Uh, as a follow-up, I will give opportunity for the Chief of Army Staff, Chief of Naval Staff, Chief of Air Staff, and the uh, Inspector General of Police to give us a little brief on what they are doing for the first 10 minutes each, and then before I'll come back to random. Uh, with the permission of the uh, Raja Rambusa, I invite the Chief of Army Staff to take the first shot. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. The House of Representatives. I am Lieutenant General Thierry Lagbaja, the Chief of Army Star. I want to start by appreciating the speakers of representative and the honorable members of uh, this house for inviting me to shed light on the activities of the Nigerian Army. And in so doing, get feedback from distinguished members who are revered representative of the people. The 1999 Constitution has amended Section 217 provided that the nation will have an armed forces consisting of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. This section of the Constitution broadly outlined some responsibility to the armed forces. And this includes the defense of the nation against external aggression, 
defeating internal insurrection, acting in aid of civil authority, and performing any other task that may be assigned by the president, commander-in-chief, or subject to the act of the National Assembly. In line with this constitutional provision, the Nigerian Army has been in existence since the 1800s. And currently, the Army is organized into a theater command domiciled in Meiduguri in the Northeast, consisting of three sectors. We have eight divisions, a special forces command, multiple brigades, and several battalions. These formations and units of the Nigerian Army are deployed across the nation and pursuant to the constitutional provision they are conducting operations and other activities to ensure that there is peace, stability, law and order across the country. Our strategy as an army to combat the multifaceted security challenges confronting us as a nation is the deployment of forces in each of the six geopolitical zones to conduct operations to combat the security threats. In this deployment, the Nigerian Army has lead in three of the zones. These deployments are joint, they are multi-agency, and in some instances, multinational in nature. In the Northeast, we have the Joint Tax Force, Northeast Operation Adding Kai. It is an army led operation, it is joint, and the bulk of Nigerian army troops are deployed in this theater. The nature of the challenge there is terrorism and insurgency. The troops are currently combating the threats and the tactics employed by these dissidents and criminal elements include the use of IED, improvised explosive devices that has resulted in casualty in men and equipment. In the Northwest, the operation is nicknamed Operation Adar in Daji. It's a man led operation, joint in nature. It is an anti-banditry, anti-kidnapping, and the operation is designed to combat other forms of uh, insecurity. In the North Central, we have two major operations. Operation Wild Punch, covering Kaduna and Niger State largely, and Operation Wild Stroke, covering Benue, Parada, Nasarawa, and parts of FCT. In the south side, the Joint Tax Force is led by the Nigerian Navy, considering the maritime nature of that environment, but the Army contributes its own quota to the success of the operation. In the operation tab, Operation Delta Save, it is designed to protect 
the nation's critical economic infrastructure and combat other security threats. In the southeast, owing to the land-based nature of the environment, the operation tagged Operation Udoka is army-led, and it covers all the five southeast states. In the southwest, the Joint Task Force is tagged Operation Awasi, designed to safeguard the critical oil and gas infrastructure and combat other challenges. Additional to this, large tax forces deployed across the six geopolitical zones. The army, your army and the people's army, also has forward operational bases designed to ensure that the troops are adequately deployed and forwardly positioned to respond to emergencies. We do not want to wait for your alarm before calling our troops from the barracks. Only we maintain about 40 of these forward operational bases all across the country. Additional to this, we conduct intelligence-based operation to act as stop guard and to ensure that there's no disruption in the troops currently deployed and forwardly poised to combat threats. And one of such operations is the operation according to Misa that is currently ongoing in the Mangu local government area of Plateau State. Operation Mugen Bubu is currently taking place in Niger State. And we have such similar operations ongoing across the country. In the conduct of these operations, the Nigerian Army we want to appreciate the support and the cooperation of the National Assembly, especially the House of Representatives, for appropriating the fund that has been used in the provision of essential welfare support and operational needs of the troops and has given the troops the flexibility to conduct operations in the field. If I'm to measure the effectiveness and the performance of these troops, I would say the troops have performed creditably. And looking back to where we came from in the Northeast, and where we got to the crescendo in 2014, while the insurgents were bent on establishing caliphate, the troops have been able to rein in the threats and achieve a great deal of stability in the northeast. In the northwest, the threat is complex. And it is adaptive. The threat started on the low level, engaged in cattle wrestling. But today, they kidnap people en masse for ransom. As a response to this evolving threat in the Northwest, the Nigerian army is talking with its operation and we're expanding our frontier to ensure we quickly facilitate stability in the Northwest. In the North Central, considering 
that most of the challenges are communal based and local to most of the communities. The Nigerian Army has had to rely on other critical stakeholders, especially the traditional rulers, the clergy, to combat the threat in addition to the use of the ad power, which is the military power. Across other zones of the country, the troops are doing well, and they are ready to go and do more. The challenges that confront these troops in the conduct of operations that I've mentioned include the, they are largely derived from the tactics employed by the criminal elements and the dissident groups. The use of improvised explosive devices confer advantage on an inferior force. And the classical example I used to use is when you have a force that use crude incendiary made with about 20,000 naira, destroying a tank purchase for about a million naira. Some of these encounters come at great cost, not only in equipment, but also in terms of personnel loss. I want to place it on record here this morning that the Nigerian Army will continue to remain responsive to its constitutional mandate. Despite the challenges that confront us as an army, the troops will continue to give their best, even at the expense of laying down their lives to ensure peace, stability, law and order in accordance with our constitutional mandate. I want to thank the distinguished speaker, the leadership, and the honorable members of this House of Assembly, uh, the House of Representatives, for inviting me to shed light on our activities, and I'm open to comments, contributions, observations, and questions. Thank you very much, distinguished representative. I am Vice Admiral E.I. Ogala, Chief of Nala Staff, and I'm delighted to be here with you on the invitation to participate in this well-intended, well-timed security sector debate for the House of Representatives. I will start my brief by starting from the known, if I go into the unknown. What all of us know here is that the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, has amended, has vested the responsibility of the defense of the nation's territorial integrity and sovereignty to the armed forces of Nigeria of which the Nigerian Navy is a part of. Particularly, the Nigerian Navy, under this constitutional rule, takes responsibility for the defense of the nation's territorial integrity and sovereignty, particularly in the maritime domain. In addition, the Armed Forces Act, which is an act of the National Assembly, has vested other rules on the Nigerian Navy. The Armed Forces Act, in addition to the rules of uh, the constitutional rules assigned to the Navy, has vested the Nigerian Navy with the role of assisting and coordinating the enforcement of all custom laws in Nigeria, in the maritime domain, 
assisting and coordinating the enforcement of all immigration laws within the maritime domain, and also assisting in enforcing all laws acceded to Nigeria, international laws, regional laws, and other conventions of which Nigeria is a signatory. The Nigerian Navy has responsibility for uh, carrying out this rule based on the Armed Forces Act. In addition, the Armed Forces Act has vested the Nigerian Navy with the responsibility of coordinating all national hydrographic surveys. If you look at the roles of the Nigerian Navy, in the Navy we will be able to classify it into three. Our basic military role, which is defense of nation's territorial integrity, then other roles we have classified them into what we call our policing roles and our diplomatic roles. And it is based on these roles that the Nigerian Navy has developed a strategy of action on how to achieve these mandates. Our policing roles are basically what we call a provision of military aid to civil authority and military aid to civil power. This is what encompasses our roles in terms of internal security, our ability to police the maritime environment, and even the strategic, our strategic involvement in the defense of the nation's offshore oil and gas resources in addition to other resources within the maritime environment. Now, looking at these rules, for us to be able to perform these rules in the maritime domain, we have to look at what is the extent of Nigeria's maritime uh, environment. Nigeria, based on the United Nations Conference on the law, Convention on the Law of the Sea, has an exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles from the baseline. Baseline means the coastline. These 200 nautical miles, considering our, coast, our coastline of about 420 nautical miles, translate to about 84,000 square nautical miles. If you convert it to square kilometers, it gives you roughly about 300,000 square kilometers, which is about one third of Nigeria's landmass. This is the extent of the responsibility that the Nigerian Navy has to police, particularly when it comes to our policing duties. And it is beyond that because uh, Nigeria, based on our strategic position in the Gulf of Guinea, sees the entire Gulf of Guinea as our maritime area of interest. And therefore, we have a larger role even beyond our exclusive economic zone. Now, this maritime area of interest and our maritime environment is the treasure base of the nation's resources, starting from oil and gas to fisheries and other mineral resources, then including the fact that it constitutes a major trade route. Of course, we all know here that over 80% of all trade between Nigeria and other countries are based on seaborne trade. This gives a vast responsibility to the Nigerian Navy. In order to carry out this responsibility, the Nigerian Navy over the years has de developed various strategies. Our, re our most recent strategy is what we call the Total Spectrum Maritime Strategy, in which we have divided the entire spectrum of our environment into five spectrums, consisting of the exclusive economic zone, the territorial waters and the inland waters, and when I say the inland waters, I mean all the creeks and rivers up to Lake Chad. Those are part of our inland waters. Then the land spectrum. It is our total spectrum maritime strategy which we have designed that enables us to be able to deploy within the land spectrum of, of uh, uh, Nigeria's, uh, uh, and that is why the Nigerian Navy is presently deployed in over 30 states of this country in support of the police and the army when it comes to internal security operations. In order to be able to achieve the objectives of this our strategy, we have developed various operational commands. We have three operational commands, one in the east, one in the central, and one in the west. We have the logistics command, we have uh, the naval doctrine command. All these are areas in which we have organized the Nigerian Navy to be able to achieve this, our statutory mandate. In line with our, spect uh, our strategy also, we have developed what we call the Trinity of Action Concept. And this is where our operations are based on three aspects. That is surveillance, response, capability, and then law enforcement. Surveillance is our ability to be able to see 
a complete picture of the maritime environment and our operating environment in such a way that we minimize our deployments to be able to achieve better results with less. In terms of this surveillance, the Nigerian Navy has developed what we call the Falcon Eye Maritime Surveillance System, which gives us a complete 24 hours all weather picture of the uh, maritime environment, particularly looking outward towards the sea. With this facility, in addition to other forms of intelligence and surveillance facility using our helicopters and others, we are confident to say that we have a complete picture of our maritime environment outside the backwaters and the creeks. Also, as part of the Trinity of Action, we have, developed, we have over the years, that developed a fleet that is competent and responsive that can respond to any identified threat which our surveillance systems uh, 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 detect. We have various offshore, offshore patrol vessels, frigates, and other patrol platforms to be able to achieve this response capability. Now, in terms of the law enforcement, the Nigerian Navy is working closely with other agencies, particularly the Nigerian police, the Nigerian uh, EFCC, and other law enforcement agencies to be able to ensure that we, when we detect, we respond, and we arrest that the criminals are actually brought into book to be able to answer for their crimes. Because we realize that no matter what we do, without the law enforcement bringing these criminals to book, we will always go back to start from the beginning. As part of this concept, within the past few years, we have been engaged in several operations. Some of these operations are basically targeted at ensuring that we reduce crimes in the maritime environment, particularly issues, critical issues of crude oil theft. Of, uh, oil theft. We all know that Nigeria is an oil producing country, and our economic survival depends on how we are able to protect that vital resource. And as such, we have several operations that are targeted towards this, and as well as securing the matter environment from other forms of criminalities. Particular note is our operation Takata Dabarao, <laughs> which uh, in Hausa language, it Okay, I, I know why the other people must are laughing. It means catch the thief. <laughs> well, this, as the name implies, the operation is designed to be able to bring crude oil theft and other criminal activities in the matter environment to a halt. When I mean a halt, may not be to reduce it to zero, but to bring it to the best minimum. And uh, since we launched that operation, what we have been noticing is a gradual and continuous reduction in the activities of these criminals. Order, please. Order. Order, please, in the house. Order. We also have several operations. Recently, we launched what we call the Operation Water Guard, mostly in the Western Front, that is between Nigeria and the, and the Republic of uh, Benin. This operation is designed to address the prevailing threat in that area, the prevailing maritime crime in that area, which is smuggling of rice, smuggling of foil to our other countries, which is one of the major areas that the President and Commander-in-Chief have directed us to make sure we face them headlong. Operator Water Guard has been critical in reducing criminal activity, particularly smuggling of petroleum products to the Republic of uh, uh, Benin and Togo and the rest of them. We have recorded a lot of successes in this regard. We are also critically I mean, engaged in uh, Operation Awasi in, in Lagos area. Of course, we all know that the lucky axis of Lagos is gradually becoming an economic nerve center of this country. If you take statistics of all the container and shipping activities that come into Nigeria, over 70% of them end up between Lagos and Ogun State. Now the Dangote refinery is also coming up. And we see this area as strategic and important. And we believe that it is only if we put our resources there that we'll be able to 
check these crimes before they escalate. And to this extent, we have established an operational base in the Lake Free Zone area and also at the Tapa Bay area. I make bold to say that the Dangote refinery has given us letter of commendation based on our activities in securing the environment with that, within that area. In addition to other various operations which the Nigerian Navy is, going, is, under, uh, is undertaking, we are also engaged in other critical areas of regional collaboration. Because for those of us who are aware of how uh, the maritime environment is a very fluid environment, there are no boundaries, even though we have maritime boundaries, but you cannot see any physical line to tell you that you are in Nigeria or you are in Cameroon or you are in another water. Moreover, ocean current flows from country to country, the fishes move around, they, are, they don't care about boundary. And that is why we must engage other neighboring countries and work in hand with them. And that is why we have been engaged in several aspects of inter uh, re international and regional collaboration. We engage in international and regional exercises, like uh, exercise of Bangami, which we just concluded recently, exercise, uh, and other uh, areas of uh, collaboration. In fact, the Yaoundé Code of Conduct, through that Yaoundé Code of Conduct of 2014, we were able to establish what we call the Regional Maritime Control Centers, both in uh, Abidjan and uh, Cameroon, whereby we exchange information with all these uh, regional uh, neighbors with a view to uh, checkmating these uh, transnational crimes in the maritime environment. Now, based on these operations, we have recorded tremendous uh, achievements over the years. I will not go into these achievements one by one, but I, will, I, I wish to put on, on, note, uh, on record here that prior to 2022, Nigeria was listed as one of the most, one of the prime pirate paying countries in the world. But based on the activities and efforts of the Nigerian Navy, the Nigerian, the Nigerian maritime environment was delisted from that list, and Nigeria is now considered a piracy free nation. This has several implications, both in terms of confidence of, uh, of investors in the maritime environment within Nigeria, and in terms of even premium on insurance uh, of, for vessels coming into Nigeria. There has been a drastic reduction in this premium, which will definitely, within a very short time, begin to impact on uh, goods and services that are coming into Nigeria. It is also a record that Within the past few, one or two months, there has been some improvement in terms of oil production. This is not just something that was by accident. It is by the continuous effort of the Nigerian Navy and other security agencies, the Army, the police, and the rest of us. We have done this because when I took over, when the first thing I told, based on my own command philosophy, is that we must purge ourselves. And by the time we purge ourselves, we'll be able to purge others. That is what we are doing. So the issue of collusion, the issue of involvement in crimes, the issue of aiding the saboteurs, I can say that we have brought it to almost zero, as I am speaking to you now. And that is why these improvements are being recorded. Sir, I want to first of all thank the House for your continuous and unflinching support to the Nigerian Navy, both in terms of making adequate appropriations for, for us to do our job, and in providing support for us. The public enlightenment, including what we are doing now, is part of those things that assist the, the people to know exactly what we are doing in order to support us and to support you. I want to thank you for that. But I must also say that the Nigerian Navy is a service that is technology-based. It is a service that is resource-based. There is no Navy that can function without adequate resources. We are doing our best within the available resources, but we continue to seek your intervention and your support to provide more resources for us to be able to do our job. These resources are basically required in terms of what we call 
fleet renewal, that is to buy more ships and platforms and aircrafts, construct jetties and, and other support facilities for the Nigerian Navy. They are also required in terms of human capital development. The Navy is just about, uh, not just about 30,000 for now. We are making effort to expand the size of the Navy and train them adequately to be able to meet the objectives of the President and Commander-in-Chief of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for the betterment of the nation and the well-being of its people. Sir. And to this end, sir, I want to just suggest a few ways forward for us to be able to do more. We are requesting the House to intervene in ensuring that we are able to enhance our surveillance capability to cover the backwaters. Like what I said earlier, our surveillance capability and using the technology-based surveillance capability captures only the coastal waters up to the EEZ and beyond. But we are looking at how to extend it to cover the backwaters, the creeks, the rivers, and other areas within the land domain that are behind the coastline. If we do this, we should be able to adequately say that those other activities of oil theft, pipeline vandalization, uh, illegal, uh, uh, illegal, uh, crude, uh, illegal refineries, and so on, we'll be able to see them 24 hours. Uh, with, 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 irrespective of the weather. As of now, we depend on human intelligence and other forms of intelligence to be able to intercept and uh, deal with these areas. And not minding that we have done a lot in this regard, there is no day that we do not deactivate some of these illegal refineries. And uh, 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 what it, it, it is always very easy for these criminals to go back and reset up. But we are dealing with them as we as we continue to face them. We also request, sir, that you, there's a deal that is pending at the National Assembly, which is what we call the Maritime Security Trust Fund. We recognize that budgetary allocations have never been enough to address all the critical challenges of any Navy, not only in Nigeria, but all over the world. And that is why we propose this uh, Maritime Security Trust Fund to enable the operators in this industry pay a little token of their profit dedicated to provision of platforms and other facilities for addressing oil theft. It will not only be channeled to the Nigerian Navy, but to all other agencies that are engaged in addressing oil theft and addressing other forms of illegalities in our maritime domain. This is one of the areas that uh, we are uh, requesting the Senate, I mean the House of Reps to uh, assist us. On this note, sir, I want to thank the speaker once again for the opportunity that you have given to me to come here and make this presentation. We are open and we are ready to take other areas of contributions and uh, uh, questions because we recognize that no man has all, has it all. And uh, we can always get something that we can use to modify our operations from this honorable house. I thank you very much, sir. God bless you. I'm Air Marshal H.P. Abubakar, the Chief of the Air Staff. Let me start by apologizing for my inability to personally appear before you last week, Thursday. Uh, it was entirely due to reasons beyond my control. Let me also appreciate the leadership of the House of Representatives for initiating this interactive forum aimed at improving the constitutional oversight of the executive arm of, arm of government. I am aware that this wonderful initiative aims at providing our lawmakers with the opportunity to interrogate government officials on areas in need of legislative interventions. Let me also use this opportunity to appreciate the federal government under the able leadership of President Bola Hamed Tinubu, 
Grand Commander of the Order of the Federal Republic, as well as member, members of this hallowed chamber, for the, for the attention given to the Nigerian Air Force in terms of platforms acquisition, maintenance, training, logistic support, and enhanced personnel welfare. These have immensely enabled the capacity and capability of the Nigerian Air Force to frontally tackle the myriad of security challenges facing our dear nation. Distinguished members, the Nigerian Air Force has consistently carried out its responsibilities and ensured its mandate is upheld since its establishment in 1964. I'm sure they are also aware that our security environment remains fluid and unpredictable due to threats posed by terrorists, insurgents, and other criminal elements. Now, in programs of efforts of the armed forces to tackle these challenges, the Nigerian Air Force has continued to conduct independent and joint operations aimed at decimating these criminal elements. This has been achieved from January to November this year through 24,795 sorties with over, again, 27,769 hours flown while consuming 15,864,000 liters of jet E1 aviation fuel. Now, this brief will apprise the distinguished members of this house with the progress being made by Nigerian Air Force operations in curbing these threats, as well as the challenges that we encounter and suggested ways forward, starting with the progress. Now, in efforts in, towards addressing activities of insurgents and other criminal elements, the Nigerian Air Force embarked on a wide range of intensive air operations aimed at not only decimating the criminals and denying them freedom of action, but also shaping the operational environment in the various status of, of operations for successful ground offensives. The Nigerian Air Force is currently involved in seven different theaters of operations across the country, and I will talk briefly on these theaters uh, one after the other, starting with the, the Joint Task Force Operation Hadi Kaye. The Air Component Operation Hadi Kaye has continued to conduct joint air operations with the Land Component and the Multinational Joint Task Force to deny the terrorists' freedom of action and degrade their capability to conduct attacks against sub targets and port troops. Order, 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 please. Within the operation, sub operations such as Operation Desert and Lake Sanity, Operation Mountain Sanity, and Operation Warun were initiated to degrade the terrorist capability and enable ground troops to exploit the environment in order to restore peace around the troubled areas. Now through these efforts, key terrorist leaders and their foot soldiers have been neutralized with many surrendering till date. Next is Operation Adel Baji. Now this operation is primarily tasked with the conduct of air operations to annihilate terrorists and combat criminal activities such as cattle wrestling, kidnapping, violent attacks, and other acts of criminalities within the joint operations areas, covering Katsina, Zanfara, Sokoto, and KB states. Now, in line with this mandate, the Air Component has con conducted several operations in coordination with the land forces, which has led to the elimination of some of the permanent terrorist kingpins. Now we look at Operation Well Punch. Operation Well Punch 
is an amalgamation of Operation Thunderstrike in Kaduna and Operation Tomaiki in Niger State. In Niger State, and an increase in the span of control that included Kogi, Kogi State, and the Federal Capital Territory. Though terrorists and bandits operating mainly around Kaduna and Niger States have been very fluid in view of the large expanse of ungoverned spaces within both states, the air components have conducted a series of operations within the joint operations area with positive consequences within the areas of responsibility. Operation Well Stroke. The mandate of Operation Well Stroke covering Beni, Nasarawa, and Taraba states is to end the incessant killings of innocent citizens by armed headers, militia groups, and other criminal elements. This has been largely achieved through the deployment of order in patrol, order case. patrol bases, conduct of Reiki, fighting patrols, raids, and destruction of identified armed militia camps, hideouts, and leading to the arrest of several militias and neutralizing several bandits. Operation Data Safe. Now, Operation Data Safe was established to curtail the means of illegal bunkering of oil, partner vandalism within the Niger Delta region. And the Nigerian Air Force was tasked to conduct appropriate air operations in support of the land and maritime components. The Nigerian Air Force has also deployed over 400 Special Forces personnel in addition to the air efforts, thereby leading to the destruction of numerous illegal oil refining sites. Our last but not the least of the operations is Operation Udoka 2. Now, the same calls by the IPOP for seed at home in the southeast led to the review of escalating security, air security in the region. And consequently, estimative intelligence demanded greater unity of ongoing collective efforts towards containing the activities of the separatist groups such as the indigenous peoples of Belfa and Issa Security Network as well as other criminal elements in the zone. Accordingly, Operation Udoka 2 was activated to serve as a precursor activity to shape security situation in the region within a four-month estimate ending by 30th of this month, November 2023. As this is activation, the operation has recorded considerable success through continuous air operations conducted against IPOB and Easter Security Network. Now, a look at some of the challenges that we face uh, in the conduct of our operations currently. These uh, include the rising cost of aviation fuel, uh, as you are aware, the budget was predicated on about 365 naira to one liter of aviation foil. But right now, uh, as of today, the cost of aviation foil is about 1,150 naira. So that has created a lot of uh, challenges for us because we can only operate when uh, we can foil the airplanes. Another challenge that we are face is delays in release, release of funding for procurement. The consistent delay in budget, uh, in, in budget funding is a significant challenge, bearing in mind that about 85% of Nigerian Air Force budget has to do with uh, procurement that are foreign, foreign exchange based. Uh, be it whether it's uh, services or equipment, it's all uh, foreign exchange based. So delays in this and then plus the volatile nature of the foreign exchange uh, that we have experienced in recent times also creates a lot of uh, challenges uh, for us in the conduct of our operations. Uh, other challenges, as we are all aware, I will not deliberate about upon our, our porous borders and then, of course, the challenges of uh, manpower. Now, distinguished members 
the Speaker, distinguished members. The Nigerian Air Force has continued to conduct both independent and joint operations in collaboration with sister services and other agencies aimed at addressing the prevalent security challenges in the nation. These efforts have contributed to improve security across the various sectors of operations. The major challenges of the Nigerian Air Force in conduct of air operations include the rising cost of aviation fuel, delays in release of funding, complexity in, the ta in targeting, porous borders, and then the poor manpower disposition. I believe that addressing these challenges will go a long way in enhancing the air efforts of the Nigerian Air Force towards alleviating the national security issues uh, facing uh, their country. Uh, I have left out a lot of detail from this brief in order to meet up with the timing. I hope that during the interactive session, uh, we'll be able to discuss more and I'll be able to give more detail on whatever issues are uh, arising I will be able to address. Uh, Honorable Speaker, distinguished uh, members, thank you very much for listening. I am the Inspector General of Police of Nigeria. I came into the office of the Inspector General of Police on June 19, 2023, with a vision to emplace a professionally competent, service-driven, rule of law compliant, and citizen-friendly police force that will support the agenda of government in the effort towards economic recovery and growth, as well as social and political development of our country. We are committed to a police force that will respond adequately and appropriately to the dynamics of crimes and criminalities in our communities. We want a police force that will be so well positioned to deliver effectively on its constitutional mandates. We want a police force that the members will be proud that they are police officers and the Nigerian youths and Nigerian people will be proud of. Unfortunately, we met on ground a police force that has been battered a police force that has suffered serious neglect over the past few years. The police also finds itself operating in a very difficult environment, partly as a result, as a direct consequence of this neglect. The manpower in the police today is grossly inadequate. Even the criminals know that. The United Nations ratio of 1 to 400 is not attainable in Nigeria as of today because the ratio in Nigeria is 1 to 1,000, which suggests that we have to double the manpower in the police and over. Provision of logistics is very poor in the police. We have 1,537 police divisional headquarters across 774 local governments in Nigeria. But getting vehicles, operational vehicles, for the division is difficult. Each of these divisions requires at least four functional patrol vehicles. But we have divisions who don't have any functional patrol vehicle as of today. Training in the police is still inadequate. The welfare of personnel is nothing to write home about. Order, please. Order, please. Funding. Can we please take our seats? Order. Funding is critical to achieving the mandates of the Nigerian police. Unfortunately, the citizens 
are not interested in our excuses for underperformance. What the citizens want is performance. They want us to serve them. We are willing to serve them, but we need your cooperation. We need funding. We need more manpower. We need logistics. We need to train our men adequately. We need to improve the welfare of our officers. We want a well-motivated workforce in the police. In spite of all these inadequacies, the police have been doing so wonderfully well in Nigeria. We have been doing our best to protect lives and properties across the country. We have been responding to the best of our ability. Unfortunately, no agency can perform beyond the limit of resources available to it. In the last five months, we have made a number of arrests. We have made a number of recoveries of illicit weapons. Some of these suspects are undergoing prosecution as we speak. But no amount of arrests that we make that will solve our security problems. Today we make arrests of 100, tomorrow more are coming out. It is not possible to arrest all the criminals and recover all the weapons. But within the environment where we function, the police has done so well and we are still doing so much. We believe in interagency cooperation and we are leveraging on the availability and the cooperation that is available from other agencies. We appeal for cooperation. We appeal for collaboration. We appeal that Nigerians should please support the police. We are implementing community policing strategies in all our communities. But we are changing, we are reviewing this and changing to policing diverse communities. This means that we want to take into consideration peculiarities of each communities in the strategies that we employ in policing a particular community. Recently, I announced the establishment of Special Intervention Squad, which is going to be a standby unit of at least a thousand men in each of the states. These men will be specially trained, they will be specially equipped, they will be specially remunerated, and be ready for deployment at shortest notice to any area of the country where there are crises. This way we intend to fight terror, to join the military in fighting terrorism in the Northeast, fight armed banditry in the North West and North Central, fight kidnapping, armed robbery across all the country, across all our, our country, and ensure that we reduce violent crimes in our country to the barest minimum. We believe that with your support, we will get the police that we want in Nigeria. There are some of these weaknesses I also want to share, but I will wait for the executive section to share the details of this. Thank you. Uh, I would like to be a bit deliberate on my presentation so that we cover up all the uh, various aspects that is required. Uh, I want to start by most uh, profoundly appreciating all our honorable, honorable members of the highly respected Hallowed Green Chamber for care and concern for the citizenry, which obviously is the main reason you extended this invitation to us. I'm further delighted when I recall that it is also an opportunity to acquaint you with the activities of the armed forces and security forces and further seek your intervention in some areas so as to enable us to perform our constitutional responsibilities seamlessly. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us to be here. Um, I believe in the legislature as a veritable arm of government and the great role you play, have been playing accounted for our presence here today. We have the utmost belief and trust that our interaction today will change so many issues 
Soft challenges are in the great down forces of Nigeria to optimally perform its assigned rules. Since our adoption to office in June this year, we have visited all the various areas of our operations and engagements to evaluate the situation and identify ways of addressing the various identified challenges. Additionally, we held meetings together jointly to enhance jointness with stakeholders in all the states that were scheduled for the recently concluded off-season elections, and I'm sure the outcome and the performance of the uh, security forces has been highly commended. This development largely contributed to the peaceful electionary activities which eventually yielded the expected outcome. We want to ensure that henceforth we uh, provide adequate security during all elections and all other activities. Our submission before you, therefore, is a product of what we saw in the film, evaluated in the process and deemed it necessary to acquaint you as appropriate so that we can all force the way forward. Now let's look at the general security situation. It's a common knowledge that Nigeria as a nation has over the past decade grappled with various forms of security challenges which are adjudged as the most precarious in its national history. These challenges range from the nefarious activities of the Boko Haram insurgents and their aff affiliated terrorist groups which started in the northeastern part of the country and gradually transcended to other regions of the country, particularly in the northwest and north central regions. In the same vein are the activities of organized armed groups in southeast and south south. The rampaging menace of criminal headsmen in various regions across the country and similar other sources of threats to our national security. Accordingly, the Defense Headquarters, which is responsible for coordinating and directing the efforts of the various services, uh, has provided the establishment of some DHP led operations. Uh, they have been mentioned. They include Operation Hard in Kai in the Northeast region, Operation Harder in Daji, and Wild Punch covering the entire Northwestern states, while Operation Wild Stroke and Save Heaven covers the entire North Central states. Similarly, our Operation Udoka in the Southeast, while Operation Adat in the Southwest, and Operation Delta Safe in the South South region, of, all of which are being conducted to ensure peace and security in Nigeria. Furthermore, through these major operations are subsidiary operations by the various services such as Operation Hakor in Damisa, in the wake of killings in Mongol local government area, Plateau State, Operation Thunder Strike, mainly to secure the Kaduna Abuja and Abuja Lokoja highways by the Nigerian Army, Operation Diran Mikia, Mikia by the Nigerian Air Force, a maritime awareness and domination operation by the Nigerian Navy through the conduct of Operation Dakata Darao and Inchikwa Oshimiri which is largely anti-piracy and domination of our waterways for the protection of our maritime assets. Necessary for security against illegal bunkering and ensuring the growth of the blue economy, which is the brainchild of the present administration. These operations have recorded numerous successes as evident in the significant decline in the rate at which villages are sacked, civilians are killed in large numbers, military bases and offices of other security organizations are attacked, as well as reduction in the rate of population displacements. Security is not a switch that today is starts and tomorrow it is off. It's a work in progress. And what we always say is that security is everybody's responsibility, not only members of the armed forces or other security agencies, but everybody has Doctor, to... please. In all these operations and conscious of our obligations under the international and domestic human rights law, planning and conduct of those operations have prioritized the protection of civilians and properties as well as to ensure the operations do not unduly affect the enjoyment of fundamental rights of Nigerians except as permitted by law. We have trained our troops to ensure that wherever we conduct, we respect the people we are protecting. And that's why our mandate is protection of Nigerians. All citizens are equal and all citizens must be protected. We have adequately warned our troops, any of them who else, we have standing court marshals to deal with such people, so we do not take prisoners. This conscious approach has also helped to win the hearts and minds of the civilian population in our areas and gather international support from our allies. Now, to achieve this, we put a number of measures in place. Firstly, during our meetings, we try to deepen jointness, jointness in operation, because it has to be collaborative, cooperative together. We reflected the inherent jointness in all operations and training, introduction of component commanders in major operations, basic uh, advanced training on air to ground integration, which is critical to our operations, key to the successes we have recorded. We have also institutionalized joint doctrine through a joint doctrine center, which we are looking at, because now all operations are joint. 
Uh, we are organizing of all joint operations completed. BHQ has 11 led operations. We have mentioned them before. For operation, uh, joint operations, we organize to improve offensive capability of our troops. Before now, we used to have situations where we await for the enemy to attack. Now, troops have been directed to go out, look for the enemy, and neutralize them. We block deployment gaps within our theater of operation. We have observed a lot of operations areas that have been left, which the enemy is using. We have blocked those ones now. We are enhancing our command and control capabilities. In the northeast, elimination of remnants of Boko Haram and Iswab members is on the front burner. Uh, we know normally after the rainy season, they will tend to want to enhance their attacks. That we have also addressed because operations have already been conducted. Over 100, uh, so far, over 140,000 terrorists have surrendered. I had the privilege of being the theater commander of Operation Hotting Cave for 19 months. We started the surrendering exercise, and before I left, we had up over 75,000 that have surrendered, both the terrorists and their family members. And as we have continued now, as we speak, we have over 140,000 that have surrendered, all awaiting the, the uh, disarmament program. Uh, no territory in Nigeria has be, is being held by the terrorists. That is very clear. No terrorists. They will have them moving here and there, but none that is under their command. Uh, the DDR, the, the disarmament program for the surrendered terrorists, is what is being awaited. Processes are being done and it's continuing. In the North Central and the North East, we equally have some that have also found out that they cannot win and they are willing to surrender. In the Northwest, we have reduction in armed banditry in the Northwest and kidnapping, uh, domination of the theater of operations, aspects of illegal mining. Uh, in the North Central, we have reduction in terrorist migration to Niger and Kaduna states. Degradation of uh, the terrorists and Saudi sleeper cells in Kogi State, enhanced security measures in the FCT and the environs through air and land domination. Illegal mining in Niger State. Honorable Senator, please you and your group, can you please be attentive? In the South South, we have increased oil production to 1.7 with a target of 2 million barrels per day by 31st December 2023. That's the mandate given to us by the President. So far, we're doing about 1.7, which we believe before the end of December, we should be able to get hit 2 million. And that's the effort of every security agency. Over 950 illegal refinery sites were destroyed. Over 12 million liters of illegal refined products seized. Over 3,725 storage facilities destroyed. Addressing relations in drafting uh, support operations. In the Southeast, we have neutralization of the iPod ESN criminal network. Reduction of attack on police stations and other locations, elimination of Monday seat at home, which we are working on. Uh, on the, for the special forces, we are also enhancing the capability of our special forces. Areas we are looking at is the post-traumatic stress disorder order of the troops, because some of them have actually operated for a very long period. We started the construction of a PTSD um, hospital where it will cater for them. Because most of them, when they come back, they have this post-traumatic stress disorder that affects them and their relationship with their families. And we need to actually prepare them to reintroduce them back to their families, or else it will become very counterproductive. Uh, we look at better management of troops, the inducting from the mission, particularly those with PTSD. Now, where areas we need capability upgrade, force multipliers and enablers. We have the UAVs we're looking at, force protection, the MRAPs, counter IED. The IEDs are the most dangerous aspects we're having, because those are the ones that actually give us most of the pains we're having now. Uh, modular platforms, manpower development, increase. Uh, the, all the services have increased, uh, have continued to sustain the recruitment exercises. And we want to be deliberate because we want to be sure who we are recruiting so that we don't recruit the criminals that will come in again and become a problem to us. On the issue of engagement with international peacekeeping, uh, currently we have troops deployed in Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, and Abe in Sudan. Successful withdrawal troops from Minos, in Mali because of the situation there and they place some infantry companies for deployment in the UN. Nigeria intends to be one of the leading uh, countries in the world, especially in the Security Council. We can only do that if we maintain a very high number of personnel in the United Nations operations. So that's very critical for us. On defense and diplomacy, international cooperation, we keep engagement through bilateral and multinational operations with the multinational joint task force, military to military contact with friendly for uh, nations, UK, US, International sports engagements, just recently, armed forces troops performed commendably in the Invictus Games in 2023 in Germany. Uh, for admin, uh, we have issues of accommodation, which is very critical for all the services. 
uh, basically, so now part of the challenges we are looking at, inadequate platforms, you know, efforts have been made, funds have been released, but what we always want to appeal is that this, we don't produce what we need in Nigeria. If you don't produce what you need, which means you are on the back and call of others that produce uh, these items. All the items we procure are bought in hard currency, known in Naira. So most times when funds are released, by the time you turn, you convert those funds into dollars, it can only get you just very little. Uh, for example, the, uh, during the last gym, about one billion was set aside for defense procurement. Out of that amount, over $600 million was for the pro procurement of the, um, um, the aircraft. $600 million. So the whole money had gone. And that is the issue. For any ammunition we buy, we buy them in dollars. Every ammunition. And we spend in millions. So most times when people see that funds are being released to the armed forces, they think it is so much. But by the time you convert them to dollars, you can really not get so much. One precision missile for our drone cost $85,000. One. Just one. So imagine how many you'll be able to use and how many you can procure. So those are the challenges. So inadequate platform presented by Black and Modern and Sophisticated Weapon System and Advanced War Machine is an impediment to the operational capabilities. The Armed Forces is grappling with the challenges of inadequate armored fighting vehicles, personal vehicles, mine resistance and ambush. Order, please. Order. Order, order tanks, As well as rookie vehicles. Additionally, the number of gun trucks, aircraft, ships, uh, things we're just contending with. Similarly, the administration with the Nigerian Navy and Nigerian Air Force. I will not have all fall to appreciate the President, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic for the unprecedented efforts of operationalizing uh, the Republic of Nigeria for the uh, Nigerian Army Aviation, which is very good and very critical for us. We also thank you, uh, the House, for approving the funds that we require, and we're making efforts to try and get those things as soon as we get the funds. Uh, on leveraging emerging military technologies, the emerging military technologies manifested in the areas of artificial intelligence, robotics, and similar other needs to be exploited by the Armed Forces of Nigeria. Similarly, there is a need to exploit the contemporary global shift in the utilization of space technology and cyber warfare for national defense and security purposes. So far, we have initiated the process of establishing a joint cyber warfare and artificial intelligence command where such emerging technologies will be exploited to enhance capabilities of the Armed Forces of Nigeria. In a similar manner, the Defense Space Administration has completed the development of Innovation and Incubation Center, which is the first of its kind in Sub-Saharan Africa. These houses, which are installed with modern technological equipment, require continuous upgrade and enhancement, which are necessary to sustain the office in order to serve its purpose of establishment. I also require your intervention in this regard as to enable the armed forces to bring these desires to fruition. On the issue of accommodation, the challenge of accommodation facility within the armed forces and the police cut across the services. It is worthy to mention that the armed forces recruit a minimum of 8,000 Nigerian per annum. Uh, I think about 14,000, because the Army does 12,000 yearly, the Air Force and the Navy. So we have about 15,000 per annum. However, this increase in the state of the personnel in relation to, this, to those that are due for discharge and retirement has occasioned the increase in the manpower capacity of the armed forces. We have barracks we have not increased, and yet we are recruiting. Sadly, there is no corresponding increase in accommodation facility to cater for the basic human need for the personnel of our uh, terms of shelter. Why is most of the troops are deployed out? By the time we start reducing the strength on ground, going back to the barracks becomes a problem because there won't be enough accommodation. This development therefore poses some negative effects on the morale and fighting efficiency of the troops. This situation will also require your intervention so as to ameliorate the challenges. Issue of funding for the operational purposes. The need to, for adequate funding of the armed forces to overcome the issues of combat supplies such as ration for the troops, petroleum, oil, and lubricant, equipment and maintenance through the procurement of spare parts and similar others in this category are necessary. To this end, there is the need for National Assembly to facilitate the continuous release of funds for the armed forces and the police for the purpose of overcoming the issues of combat enablers and combat suppliers, which are recurrent in nature but very necessary for sustenance of the troops. And now, encouraging media reports uh, with the media, uh, one of the challenges encountered is the fact that media often take delight in reporting the activities of terrorists and insurgents. Sometimes when we look at it, it's bad news, it's good news to them, but it's demoralizing to the troops. So any attack that insurgents or terrorists receive wide media reportage 
to the extent that the citizens begin to doubt the capacity of the government to protect them. However, the successes gains of the military and other security agencies are not either not reported or are reported just minimally. Uh, this does not endure citizens of the Air Force and other government security agencies. This government has made the government to lose public confidence and the security agencies to lose the trust and sympathy of the populace, which ultimately encouraged insurgents terrorists while affecting the government security uh, agencies at all times. Areas of intervention that we're looking at. Uh, having highlighted some of the challenges confronting the Air Forces in the seamless execution uh, operations, there are areas that I most uh, sincerely solicit your support. These are briefly highlighted, uh, just in the brief, creation of defense and security intervention funds. The National Assembly should initiate a bill for legislation that will cater for extra budgetary allocation for the armed forces and police. This could be by requiring corporate organizations such as telecommunication airlines, uh, uh, communications airlines, oil companies, and similar others to designate at least 2% of its annual profit for defense and security purposes. We feel that will complement because the budgetary allocation cannot actually give us what we require. In a battalion, an infantry battalion, we need about 88 APCs. None of the APCs is less than $2 million. So if you imagine for a battalion, we have God knows how many battalions. So it's, the budgets cannot adequately uh, fund the armed forces. Increased budgetary allocation for equipment procurement. The need to increase allocation of defense and security will be necessary. This will enable the, uh, the security forces to bring fruition all this projection for establishing of infrastructure and outfits that could enhance national defense and security. Such infrastructure and office could include the establishment of the Joint Cyber Warfare and Artificial Intelligence Command, among others. Um, we also looked at the issue of increase in salaries. I know increase of salaries is bringing a lot of issues, but I think for a private soldier in the Army, it takes less than 50,000 for all the work he's doing. I think it's not adequate. On the issue of uh, allowance RCA, ration cash allowance, where we feed, from myself as a general to the last soldier, I'm being fed on 1,500 naira per day. That's my feeding. A feasible and realistic plan for medical, medical. There's a need to ensure that personnel who suffer life-threatening combat-related injuries or are at the point of permanent disabilities are evacuated abroad for advanced medical attention in the short term while efforts are ongoing for the upgrade of various military hospitals. All this will require... Order. Leader, Order. will you stand up for recognition? Order, please. Leader. All this will require... Yeah, the speaker, there are so many leaders on this road, sir. You mean Leader Dogua or Leader Jobe? No, Leader Dogua. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sure you have been seen now. You can sit down. <laughs> All this will require funding, which the House of Representatives will know that plays some better roles in this regard. Now, based on my experience, uh, we have the, the privilege that uh, all the four of us here were at Academy at NDA at the same time. I came in in 1986, they came in in 1987. We have want to also be from the same house at NDA, so we have known ourselves all this while, and that's why working together has made it very, very seamless in what we do. And that's why you never hear anything about rancor or infighting between anybody. We have mutual respect, mutual understanding that we have the same goal to bring peace to Nigeria, and that's what we focus on. Now, based on those experiences, those are some of the areas that I feel the legislative can also come into. Most times we tend to think that security is only the uh, responsibility of security forces. And I said no, that everybody has a responsibility to play. We can never be everywhere. So we need education and sensitization program for all Nigerians to understand that security is everybody's responsibility. What you see, you talk about it. You don't just keep quiet and say it is for the police or for the army. No. Everybody has a role. Our, member, our uh, neighboring countries, if you enter there as a visitor, I give you two, 30 minutes, they know you are a visitor. Before you know it, the gendarme is coming after you because they report. But here, it's different. People tend to think that it is not their responsibility. We should, we're not magicians. So we need to have a system where we can train from schools, from primary schools. Let every Nigerian understand that this is his country. Let him take ownership of security, and it will make it a lot easier. The awareness will be a lot easier, and then we we'll take uh, personal responsibilities. Now, we have also realized that the magic wand to address security challenges, good governance. Anywhere you have good governance, security goes down. Insecurity goes down. 
Without which it's a problem. The security forces can only provide 30%. We can only provide the enabling environment. If other aspects are not addressed, it is a problem. Security is not only military security. We have food security, health security, social security, educational security. So all these play vital roles into achieving what we are doing. So if we don't put these things in place through good governance, it becomes a problem. In the Northeast, we are able to achieve so much because we had elements of good governance. We have seen governors that are willing and doing things to make the people happy. And that has transcended to the successes we are having. So it is important. Like I mentioned earlier, the issue of IEDs has remained the most potent threat we have. They put this IED on the ground because there are no roads. A vehicle can't in everybody in that vehicle is either killed or dismembered. So it becomes a problem. People can't eat. If people are hungry, no matter how you tell them to keep the peace, they will not because they have to eat. And it aids criminality. So those are the aspects we're looking at that it is important that we must have good governance wherever we are. Let everybody have this belief in the country that this is his country and that he's been looked after. It makes it very easy. Um, border control. Nigeria is one area where our borders are porous. We have over a thousand plus borders. People can come in and out at will. And that's where we have movement of light weapons and small arms freely into Nigeria and out. Human trafficking is rampant. Use of drugs rampant. Criminals come in at will and go that will. So please, it's important that we must be able to establish a good border control so that we can know who is coming in and who is going out. Uh, forest guards. Niger State alone has over some of the three forests. Niger State alone. All are manned. Those are areas where these non-state actors use to protect their, 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 their activities. We must be able to find out how we can hold those places down together. The issue of judiciary. I've been in the Northeast. There are a lot of uh, Boko Haram elements that have been captured and have been kept. We have kept them for over five, six years. We, the armed forces, cannot prosecute. We can only provide protection for them. There have been, some of them have been found to be wanting, but no prosecution. So we are keeping them for this lengthy period. Everybody accusing the armed forces of keeping them uh, against their human rights, but we cannot prosecute. So the issue of that one aspect. Another aspect of the judiciary is this. You do all your efforts. You make an arrest. You hand over. Before you enter your vehicle, the man is released on bail. Now you have risked yourself in doing that. By the time he is released, he goes to tell the people who you are, and then your family members or you are at risk. So it gets to a stage where the security forces are not even willing to do it, because once you and get an arrest, the person is released. We have the issue in the south-south. A lot of the ships, we had, the last ship, the other ship that was arrested, was arrested 10 years ago. It was arrested, it was handed over, the ship went and changed its name, changed its color, and came back again. 10 years later, we arrested the same ship. And by the time you hand over the ship, before you know it, it's released. So please, I think that's one area that we really, really, really look, need to look into. And don't this is. And that's why we have, the, the only option we have now is we arrest, we go down, and then we go down quickly. Hold up, please. Because the longer we keep it, it becomes a problem. We, become, we come under pressure to release it, or while it is released, it is taken back. So please, it's one area that I think the legislature need to, uh, need to look at in, into. The issue of correctional facilities. In the Northeast, when we, when we got the, um, when, when we were debriefing some of the arrested uh, Boko Haram elements, so they were telling us how, from the prisons, they could plan operations out in the field. From the prisons, they plan operations. They pass funds across. And we said how? They use some of the orders from there. We don't say all of them are bad, but they use some of them. They use their accounts to transfer money. And the deal is anybody's account who money is transferred to, they share 50-50. Those are the areas, those are the challenges we I have. Mean. And if you look at where we have the facilities, they've all been occupied now. The, the Kuje facility, you have a school sharing well with the, with the, with, with, with the, with the prison here in Ibadan. The marketplace is where, you are, is where you pass to go to. So I, I think we need to really look at this system. Well, it's it's really to have, to have, to have um, good control in these areas. Now, sir, one basic area we're looking at is this issue of the Southeast. Simon Epa. So this individual has become a menace to this country. Someone has become a menace to this country. 
So the country must act on it diplomatically. Finland is having a free way, encouraging him to do what he's doing. By his utterances and his actions, he's affecting what is happening in Nigeria. We should never allow that, sir. So I think our foreign service need to step in to address such issues. It's either we invite the, uh, the, the ambassador or somebody, they must explain why they are protecting him. And he's doing us more harm because by his utterances, a lot of people have been killed. We cannot sit back and just keep quiet. I think it's very, very important, sir. Then the aspect, lastly, is the issue of illegal mining. Most of the crisis we're having, especially in North Central, North, Northwest, issue for mining. Gold is being mined. The states are not benefiting from these things. We must take contract actions. There must be legislation on these issues so that we can have control. Let the states take over and be able to control so that people can have the benefit of these minefields. Um, on the general terms, I want to say thank you for this opportunity, sir. Uh, we're here to answer more questions. Thank you very much, sir. More educated about what the uh, armed forces are doing, what their gains are, and what their um, challenges are. So, without any waste of time, we we'll now uh, kickstart the question and answer session. And uh, with your kind permission, I will uh, recognize. I recognize Honorable Abu Bakr Nal Araba to ask his question. My highly respected colleagues, our guests, the service chiefs, the chief of defense staff. First, I would like to commend you for this eloquent presentation. And we are more informed, like, like what Mr. Speaker said, and more enlightened. Also, Mr. Speaker, I would like to use this opportunity to commend the Nigerian Armed Forces. They are the most loyal armed forces in the world, considering what they have been going through and their living environment. My question is, Mr. Speaker, how effective is the national counterterrorism strategy being in the whole of government approach to fight terrorism? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To answer, so your question is targeted to who? The Chief of Defense Staff, Mr. Speaker. Chief of Defense Staff. So please, sir, can you take notes? Speaker, um, a sizable number of the service chiefs and the uh, IG touch on the area of manpower within the services. Okay, considering the experience and the reservoir of knowledge acquired by some of our retired military personnel and the police, what are you doing or what have you done to leverage on the experience and knowledge of our retired personnel that are lying down there in order to help you address some of the security challenges that we are facing. Thank you. Your question is uh, to all of them, sir. We have got to identify one, so we will give it to the Chief of Defense Staff. C CDS and the IG. CDS and IG, so please take notes. Mr. Speaker, my questions is to the all the service chief and the inspector general of police. There are concerns by Nigerians that the seeming reluctance by the security agencies to share intelligence, to share intelligence may not have helped the security situation in the country as of today. What are you going to do differently to ensure that you collaborate with one another to get a good results as expected by Nigerians? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I use this opportunity to welcome the service chief and the IG into the chamber of the House of Representatives. And I equally use the opportunity to thank them for their services 
to our dear country. My question, Mr. Speaker, the northwestern part of the country is being bedeviled by banditry, kidnapping, terrorism, and other crimes, which measures both short and long term are they talking to combat the situation and remain, return the whole country to normalcy? Then the second question has to do with does the Nigerian army has enough manpower and equipment to fight and defeat terrorists in order to combat the current situation we are in? These are my two questions. Honorable colleagues, our invited guest, Mr. Speaker, I have question goes directly to the Chief of Army Staff. We have heard your solution, your presentation, and the list of numbers of operations that currently ongoing in different regions. My concern here is the operation Hadar in Daji. You have launched this operation, or rather Nigerian Army have launched this operation on 19 March 2021, with the aims of combating banditry, kidnapping, and catching roasting. But unfortunately, of the land that we are speaking here in this chamber, the numbers of bandit camp have increased than it was before. And to of army staff, you have all intelligent information. I believe you have. Before, in Sokoto, we don't have numbers of calm of banditry across the local government. But believe me, today, in Goranya local government, my own local government, you have the intelligent information, and a lot of people you don't know, but you have it, that there is more than five bandit camp in Goranya local government. Not far away, five kilometers to the communities of their surroundings. Two of our staff, Operation Hadar and Daji, the results that the Nigerian army are targeting to achieve through that operation, that result was defeated, or rather almost defeated. We want the Nigerian army, army, chief of defense staff, what hold on, I'm ready to my question. I hope the floor, I'm ready to my question. We, we want all of you, and you know, I know, I want the permission. Honorable Colonel, please. I'm ready to my question. You ask permission not to lecture. I, I, I'm ready with my question, sir. Please. I need your protection. You and please and ask your question directly, please. I'm please ready, I'm ready, sir. To my people staff, to my family staff, you know, observation or advice would be to the Chief of Defense Staff and the Chief of Army Staff. In my constituency, as small as some people may consider it to be, there is uh, a company... Honorable Marquesa, Madam wants you to, attend, to listen to what she said. Very important. There is a company that builds APCs and a lot of security vehicles is called Profos, and I'm sure you know about them. I think they need to be encouraged and um, 
if perhaps you are not at this point in time patronizing them, they should be patronized because that would most probably reduce the number of um, importation and reliance on importation with regards to APCs and other security equipments that you might need. Uh, because this is a security outfit, I do not know all the things they do, but I know for a fact that they do APCs. Um, that is on one hand. You have intelligently told us your analysis and assessment of the situation that you have on hand. You have also asked this house um, on the assistance that they can give you with regards to your budgetary allocation. Would it not be suffice to say that it is important to have a kind of summit that would in include the legislature, the judiciary, all the people that you feel need to be attentive to the situation and challenges that you're going through so that there would be a, not a charade, but good discussions on the way forward and how you can be assisted with regards to making your job a little more easier than it is at the moment. I also wanted to say to you that local intelligence, a lot of people have complained that when they give information to the chief, um, to the security agencies and the police, they get round to be haunted with regards to the information that they pass across. It is important that you indeed make the people who are the best eyes that you have also said here today that um, security is a job for everybody. You need to also make them very comfortable with regards to being you being approachable for them to give you information and their lives not being at risk at the same time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and honorable colleagues. Mr. Speaker, my question is very simple. What are the strategic priorities of the defense sector and what mechanisms have been put in place to ensure implementation? My question goes straight to the CDS. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First and foremost, I'd like to appreciate our service chiefs and the Inspector General for this for doing their best to ensure continuous survival of our great nations. Secondly, my question goes to the Chair of Defense Staff. What is the operational commander of the Nigerian Armed Forces, especially in the situation of war? I want to know who is the operational commander in a situation of war. That is number one. Then number two, how does the who is in charge of the operation in North West and North East? Because we have so many uh, situations in North West and North East. I want to know who is in charge, specifically. Is that the Chief of Army staff, the CDS, or who among the cyber chiefs is in charge? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question is a very simple and straightforward one. But before I do that, it is important I join my colleagues to commend the effort put together by the security forces, particularly the Chief of Army Staff. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Chief of uh, Defense Staff, in his submission, has substantially answered my questions. But for emphasis sake, it is necessary and very important that he gives us a list of the issues he considers important and germane for the House committees, relevant committees, to immediately attend to so that the House will be able to swing into action in response to some of their issues. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker, my question goes directly to the Inspector General of Police. Mr. Speaker, I first need to commend the Inspector General of Police. He was just confirmed recently, and from his speech, we have had the effort that he put 
and we need him to put more. So, based on your explanation, Mr. Inspector General of Police, what do you, what would you say is the most significant and lingering challenges hampering the effectiveness of the Nigerian police force? And what do you propose to this Hanoi Chamber that will be the uh measures to take? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I want to first of all uh, welcome our service chiefs who are here. We should also note that uh, since the inception of this 10th assembly, we have at one point or the other observed a moment of silence owing to the killings of Nigerians across the all the geopolitical zones in Nigeria. And this has become of great concern. I'm talking coming from the southeastern part of this country. I want to know, because some of these security challenges are politically motivated, I want to raise or ask this question to our service chiefs. If there is any plan for them to use some political solutions to solve some of these politically motivated security challenges, that is uh, my question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to first and foremost appreciate the chief of uh, Naval Staff for your open apology for not being here uh, uh, last week in person. Going forward, I want to take a cue from the submission of the Inspector General of Police regarding the recovery of arm um, as far as your uh, submission was concerned. Permit me to, on that note, keep clear as all the security chiefs that uh, recent uh, submission showed that majority of the small small harms that uh, are in circulation um, were legally acquired through security armories or uh, armories from agencies of our security uh, 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 places. My question is this, what are your clear commitment and uh, what you've been able to do regarding all these uh, illegal small arms that are virtually everywhere all over the country? And two, precisely, I may wish to know, on behalf of this house, on account of all these harms that are in circulation, what specific efforts are you making in making further recovery, just like uh, IG has uh, specifically mentioned? Thank you, sir. My question, I uh, first of all commend Mr. Speaker for this thought of having this session. It's a wonderful thing. And also commend all, commend all the service chiefs and the IG who are here. We do recognize the sacrifices that are being made by the, our military, who are our brother. Very supreme sacrifice. My question is simple. Um, the Chief of uh, Defense Staff uh, spoke about uh, welfare, as it were. Oh, well, let me know why you're going to go back to your seat. Welfare, as it were, but um, I'm looking at welfare as it regards uh, retired military personnel. Because once the 
military personnel leaves office, the next one or two months you see them, they are totally different person. Coming from a military family, I understand the fact that uh, the uh, retired personnel are not, their welfare are not well taken care of in terms of pension, in terms of gratuity, is not paid on time, and even uh, debt compensation to we their widows and families are not paid on time. My question is, you have opportunity to present your budget to this uh, National Assembly. Why is the military and police particularly don't you have records. You know who will retire at what time. You have records. Why you don't envisage it? I'm waiting for Mr. President to make a pronouncement like he made some weeks ago for your retired personnel. It's very indicting. My second question here is, I come from Southeast. Southeast is highly militarized. Police army. Our brothers and sisters die every minute. Every minute. I thought that the military could use what they call or advise the executive on what they call non-kinetic energy to quench means, to quench this kind of uh, unarmed agitators from the southeast. Don't assume. Very please he has the protection of the chair. Yes. Allow him to ask his question. Yes. Particularly very unarmed brothers and sisters of ours from Southeast because is underreported the level of debt coming from Southeast on issue of quenching on armed agitators. When democracy, everybody has right to agitate. So those are my questions. Thank you, Leader. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Before going direct to my question, being the chairman of the National Security and Intelligence, I would like to draw our attention a little a bit regarding the submission made by the CDS, who happens to be somebody I know long before uh, becoming the chief of defense staff. Being the second longest serving theater commander of the operation, Hadin Kai, I know him together with the chief of army staff, who happens to be a chief of staff in Monguno, in 8th Division. These are men that I believe Mr. President appointed them, not by coincidence. We have seen the synergy that we have been crying for long existed in between them. They have made it categorically to us the challenges they have, the cumbersome of the crisis we are managing in this country. If you will quantify it in terms of resource and manpower, we will appreciate them and we will immediately resort to an executive session to look into a solution. This time around, Mr. Speaker, I want to put it to you straight, Mr. Speaker. Whatever you will going to do within the powers compared on you and this legislative chamber, we should make sure that we have made force a bi-level not only the budgetary allocation, think outside the box to provide a resource for the employment of Nigerians into the police, into the military. If you look at all this crisis, we have to wear our thinking cap without empowering and considering the welfare of our security operation. They have said the deficit clearly to us. If you look at the population of Nigeria, with what they have on ground, definitely the issue needs a critical and logical conclusion. They have said it clear. And my question goes to the IG first directly. 
He said to tell the police, please, when are you reviving the Mopol unit in Limankara? Goza, which I believe the second stronghold of Boko Haram is in the Mandara Mountain as I'm speaking to you. They will run to the high hill, attacking our security operatives day and night, attacking farmers, slaughtering farmers. And to the CDS and the chief of army staff, which I know, they have said it clearly what I want to ask. What is the benefit of the technology that you are having now and what are your challenges if we will involve the culture of providing more into our security and defense system in terms of cyber security and technology? Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Speaker, I wish to start by commending the service chiefs and the IG on their efforts in quelling the security situation in Niger State. Mr. Speaker, with their coming, we've had relative uh, stability in terms of peace, and uh, the way the activities are coordinated, I think, is about is what is bringing about the success being recorded so far. So I wish to encourage them, commend them, and encourage them in uh, keeping up with doing what they have started. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, recently I was privileged to accompany my governor to Rwanda, Kigali, to be precise. And uh, one of the takeouts was uh, the organization, the professionalism, and the smartness of their security men, especially the men of their police force. So I wish to direct my question to the IG. What can we do in the immediate time to enhance professionalism of our, of our policemen, given that what you have today is far from what they are supposed to be? Uh, we may take inspiration from other, uh, other countries, but in specific time, what can we do? What do you think we need to do to change their orientation to enhance their professionalism for the betterment of um, our country? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I want to first and foremost thank you for this privilege and opportunity for us to interface with the leaders of this very critical national segment of our country. It is a good thing that you have done, and posterity will bear you witness as one of the great leaders of this country who has helped greatly to, towards solving the security challenges bedeviling the country. Mr. Speaker, distinguished colleagues, I also want to align myself with the submissions of the very distinguished honorable colleagues who have made their submissions in applauding and celebrating the sacrifices of the Chief of Defense Staff, the, the other security chiefs, and the Inspector General of Police. As a matter of fact, I have it in good authority that since their appointment, they have done very, very well. Mr. Speaker, the challenge today, we have equally seen this in the past, that the first few months of the appointment of security chiefs in the country will definitely experience some level of positive gains. I want to believe that the current security chiefs please summarize the question. So many people are ways are so as their own place. Mr. Speaker, sir, my question will be to the Chief of the First Staff who made reference to the issue of human rights. Human rights is a very critical and important aspect of the war against insecurity everywhere in the world. So my question to the Chief of the First Staff will be to elaborate before this hallowed chamber the measures that they are putting in place to forestall unnecessary human rights abuses by our troops so that we will curb the excesses of international non-state actors who will come to interfere with the good work that they have started. I so submit, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, having listened to the service chiefs, particularly the Chief of Defense Staff, and Chief of Army Staff, they have alluded to the fact that they are not properly funded. They alluded to the fact that they need more equipment. But there's a missing gap. At your own level, there may be synergy. How well have you been able to drive this synergy down to the local government areas? We are representatives of the people. Most often, we we'll find clashes between police, we we'll find clashes between SSS, we we'll find clashes between civil defense. So at that level, there's no coordination. 
you can you are in a command position. You cannot go to that level. So what steps have you have take have you taken to drive the synergy down to the lowest level? Without synergy, equipment cannot use themselves. Without synergy, the fund cannot give us the desired result that we expect to get. Because what happens is what we are relying on what happens to the down level. That is the lowest level of security apparatus. That is where I want the service chief to address, particularly the police, army, civil defense that are not here today, and the SSS are not here today. So the three services that are here, please. First of all, I'd like to commend our able speaker for bringing us together today. Because the issue of security... Tureki, can you sit down, please? The issue of security... Leader is said that you inform you cannot go anywhere until after this uh, session, please. This message is from uh, Adudu Gua. So you should sit down, please, and be attentive. The issue of security involves every single member of the Nigerian society. Every Nigerian has... Every Nigerian's major concern is security. Because without security, all other sectors and development of government cannot continue. So my question to you is, to all the service chiefs, what are the root causes of insecurity in Nigeria? From Boko Haram, to kidnapping, to banditry, we all suffer. Every person here is, is a victim of one of these things in our communities. So we're looking for you to look out while you are collaborating with the executive, always to ask them to sit down with your good selves and find out the root causes of this insecurity in Nigeria. Go back to the drawing board if need be. Check and balance it to make sure and ensure that the mandate given to you by the constitution of this country is carried out to the letter. That is the protection of lives and property. Now, just recently, in the northeastern part of Nigeria, I'm talking in particular in Yoga State, in Gaidon local government, and also on the way from Meidubri to Dematu, the convoy of the governor was attacked. Now, this insurgents had disappeared for quite a while. But what I noticed was that they had dismantled the, the checkpoints along this road. So what we basically need, I think, is more personnel to be employed in all the sectors of security in this country. Our children are idle. They don't have any jobs. They can be, well, they can be employed in such, you know, in, 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 in these paramilitary places where they can be of great help instead of staying idle and an idle man is a devil's workshop. So please, everybody has something to say. I won't take more time than I've already taken. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, well, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at this point. My respected colleagues, mine is not like a question. Mr. Speaker, I am coming on point of clarification and possibly to highlight our institutional mandate and our constitutional jurisdiction as an institution. I would like to share with your leave this jurisdictional responsibility of the institution to our very respected service chiefs and the Inspector General of Police. But Mr. Speaker, honorable members, that by the provision of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, which is the supreme document that guides the operations of Nigeria's democracy, specifically Section 181 in the case of Mr. President, and Section Section 181 in the case of Mr. President and 121 in the case of governors of our states, that they write the powers to initiate estimates, budget, budget estimates, lies in the executive arm of government. It lies solely in the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as contained in the Constitution. I'm coming this way, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, honorable members, because by the institutional memory, each time we are engaging our service chiefs and the inspector general of police, each time we engage them, 
They come around here to shout for more funds, more funds, more funding, more funding. Agreed. This is the protected hallowed chambers of the people of Nigeria. But if you really want funds to be provided, going by the provision of our constitutions, you must, you must shout and look for more funding from the executive arm of government where the estimates of our budgets is being initiated as provided by the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. When you do that, and the budget is submitted to the floor here for approval, of course, this same constitution does not give the executive powers, executive arm of government, the powers to approve the budget. The powers lies here. And even when they present a good and wholesome budget in favor of the security, we also have the powers to increase that. But that will only be more reasonable if it is initiated and submitted to us by Mr. President on behalf of the executive of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That is what the law says. And I also want to say, without fear of contradiction, that by our tradition and by our institutional responsibility, Mr. Speaker, you can be a living, you can also be a living witness, and so many members here are living witnesses, that we have never taken for granted at any point in time the budgetary provisions of our security institutions. It has always been a seamless passage on the floor. The chairman of the House Committee on Appropriation is seated here. He was the chairman of the Committee on Works the last time, and I believe the Ninth Assembly Chairman of the Committee on Appropriation, Honorable Betara, is also here seated. We have never tinkered, we have never contemplated to stop or reduce any provision in respect of our security operations. We believe no amount of money is too much for security. The business of every elected government is about security of lives and property, and we have held that sway. So I want to put this across to my respected service chiefs that you must have to begin the quest for more funding from the executive arm of government. And I assure you, by the leave of the speaker and the 10 principal officers of this house and those smaller members of us that are here, we will support it and protect it here for the benefit of our people. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is my submission. And I want to ask my last question. <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, Mr. Speaker, if you allow me, did the last, the last, the last, the last, and another man before the last, the last, okay, Tom. Yeah. And with the leader of the house, this one might be maybe on a lighter mood. As far as I know, and I believe as far as the speaker knows, I believe even Chinda knows uh -huh. that the only, the only APC in Nigeria is the solid ruling party APC, which is indivisibly an institution of the political party. Uh, I hear, uh, sorry, my, my question. I hear the chief of defense, the chief of defense staff in his presentation saying that they have 89 APCs in the barracks. I want you to clarify which other APCs, which other APCs do we have in the barracks apart from the ruling APC? I would like to know that. That's my question. Mr. Speaker, I want to join my colleagues in commending the service chief, chief of defense staff, the inspector of general of police for a wonderful and a good job they were doing. Mr. Speaker, I listened to their presentation, particularly the presentation of the chief of defense staff, whereby in his own presentation, you mentioned the issue of illegal mining. Mr. Speaker, my question here to the service chief, the inspector general of police, and the chief of defense staff. The issue of the illegal mining constitutes 50% of the security challenges, particularly in the northwestern state and other zone where the mining, illegal mining activities is taking place. Honorable colleagues, Mr. Speaker, what will surprise you, most of the areas, particularly in the northwestern state, where the illegal mining is taking place, the issue of the banditry and the issue of kidnapping and other security challenges are also taking place in those respective areas. But the mining activities is also going on there simultaneously without having any issue of challenges. Mr. Speaker, my question here. What are the service chief, inspector general of police, and the CDS 
doing in bringing an end of the issue of the illegal mining, which I believe it is being resolved, it has solved the 50 percent problem of the security challenges we are having, Mr. Speaker. That's my question to the CBS. Let me join our colleagues here for commending the service chiefs for how far we have come in six months from what we used to be. Having said that, you've spoken about collaboration with agencies. I'm aware that Nigeria has what we call a satellite through night concerts. And Nigeria borrowed money Come back to, to set up this satellite agency to oversee the entire country. How much information do you get from night concerts pertaining to movement of bandits around the Oman forests, which you alluded to, and other areas? This is to the CDS. My other question is to the Chief of Nova Staff. In your presentation, you spoke about over 300,000 square meter of waterways that we have in Nigeria. Could that be responsible for the consistent theft in our major revenue, which is oil, major source of revenue, which is oil? Can you please respond to the allegation that naval officers lobby to be posted to these areas where our oils are based? They lobby to be posted there. Can you respond? The next question, of course, is to the IG. Talking about human rights. The movement around the speaker is much. People should try and reduce it so that he can focus. Thank you. Talking about human rights, Inspector General of Police, will you say your men are properly educated as long as, I mean, as far as uh, human rights in a democrat, democratic government is concerned? and what they, are, what they can do and what they should do, or do you think that they should be properly trained in observing human rights in a democracy? And of course, the welfare of the police, which you mentioned. I want to confirm, is it true that policemen buy their uniforms on their own and even with ammunition? If so, who are the sellers of these ammunition and the uniforms? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question is about the capacity of our armed forces that is being underutilized. In the areas of peacekeeping, vis-a-vis -vis construction. My colleagues, Nigeria Army has the best construction company. Nigeria Army has the best construction company. In 1999, Mr. Speaker, the governor of Oyo of Oshun State then, Chibisi Akonde, employed the Nigerian Army Company to construct our roads in Oshun State. Largely, we are still using those roads now. So I want to ask the Chief of Army Staff, to what extent are you deploying the capacity of the Nigerian Army Engineering Company? On, on the side of uh, peacekeeping operations, Mr. Speaker, in other crimes like Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, they have used peacekeeping operations. Can you please see me? They have used peacekeeping operations, Mr. Speaker, to employ a large number of their youths. So it has served as a source of employment vis a vis generation of forex. United Nations Security Desk found Nigeria as a worthy partner to salvage Liberia, Syria alone, Darfur, 
and I can continue to mention, but in recent times, Mr. Speaker, we've not had anything about Nigerian exploit in peacekeeping operations. I will want to ask the Chief of Defense Staff, the leaders of the armed forces, to tell this parliament what are they doing in, in these two areas. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, colleagues, well, let me align myself with uh, everybody in appreciating uh, the service chiefs. All over the world, I believe that all over the world, we appreciate, citizens appreciate the armed forces. We encourage them because they, they are doing the work for everybody. So in doing so, I also want to align myself with uh, my brother, uh, Waloke, because I believe that the arm, the about the construction, outside construction, that's supposed to bring revenue for them, we also need to go into agriculture. I believe that the military can feed the nation if they, are, if they are serious about it. So they should go into not only construction, they should also go into uh, agriculture because this will enhance their, their revenue. Because we talk with, if they have enough, if they have enough. Um, so are you making a comment or are you asking a question? So that we I clearly know. Yeah, we will ask. In terms of, uh, in the sense of uh, power generation, permanent solution in the sense of uh, uh, refineries, these are some of the things that will create jobs. If we don't have jobs, this problem will continue to uh, to suffer. So one, I'm asking uh, the, 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 the armed forces, do they still have, do they have any other means of revenue generation instead of their location that they are having? Thank you. Mr. Speaker and my very distinguished colleagues, my concern is about the Nigerian police. And I'm happy that the world will hear me today. We are very much aware of the situation in River State, where there was an alleged attempted assassination of the governor of River State, elected by the people. And the Nigerian police have not given any, any explanation to what has happened. Rather, it was just a mere redeployment of the police commissioner. Mr. Speaker, we are also aware that the River State House Assembly has been divided. And there was an attempt. Honorable Abente, are you opposed to just asking a question? Exactly, sir. Exactly, sir. Rather than giving a political uh, statement. Exactly, sir. This is the, uh, a security my, 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 engagement. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, yes, yes, sir. Ask the yes, question straight. Mr. Speaker, yes, sir. Yes, sir. My, please, my be well, please be well my guided. Don't speak when the speaker is speaking. It's not the Nigerian police. It bothers the neutrality of the Nigerian police and their faithfulness in defending democracy. Because as we speak, as we speak, the only reason they gave for attempting to assassinate one of the speakers, the functional speaker of the House of Assembly, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My, uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you so much for the protection. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Nigerian police, what is their level of neutrality? in the protection of Nigerians and Nigerian institutions. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, let me join my other colleagues who have commended the service chiefs and their gallant officers and men that are out there on a daily basis to protect we Nigerians. Mr. Speaker, on that note, I would like to use this opportunity to highlight the challenges that members have brought before this People's Parliament with regards to the security issues since our inauguration June 13th. The service chiefs, it will interest you to know that we have received over 100 motions with regards to needing security presence within our constituency. And I can assure you more than 90% of those motions is the military. 
very few have spoken about the police. And this shows a tacit vote of confidence that the Nigerian people have all the constituencies, or we the parliamentarians have on this institution of the military. On that note, I would like to highlight a very important issue, which is one of the fundamentals for us to achieve security. Like we all know, Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, Section 214 of the Constitution highlighted the powers of the police, where this parliament or the National Assembly is empowered to make laws for them. And like you all remember, in 2020, we have the new Police Force Act. And let me highlight that act. I think, I will go there, I will go there, please, leader. It says the police shall prevent and detect crimes. The police shall maintain public safety. The police shall maintain law and order. So my comment is, there needs to be a synergy whereby in the long run, we need the police to start doing the work the military is doing today. Most of the work the military is doing today is the work of the police. So I think we have to have a strategy where the police will gradually come in. And how can the police come in? Like the IG made mention, he made a police that is battered. But Honorable Alassane Dugua has brought a solution. We in the parliament, we will assist, but you need to start from the executive. What we need to do, Mr. Speaker, Honorable Colleagues, as soon as possible, which the Chief of Naval Staff highlighted, is the Maritime Security Trust Fund. It will interest you to know in 2018, then as the Chairman House Committee of Navy, we championed that bill and took it to Villa. Unfortunately, one of the ministers there made sure that that bill did not see the light of the day. So as a parliament, if we are able to assist the Navy to have the Maritime Security Trust Fund, which is within our own body, because that is what we are supposed to do to make laws. I can assure you then, and you ask uh, your question? I will get there, Mr. Speaker, sir. So please go to the question now. It's straightforward, Mr. Speaker, which has to do with the funding that all of them highlighted. You have made mention in our legislative agenda last week, security is a priority. The issue of oversight, the issue of oversight will be like never before. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my arise on order eight, rule five, personal explanation. Mr. Speaker, the People's House is represented by many political parties here. In this debate, we've had over 22 speakers, of which the majority of the speakers are APC <laughs> and PDP and three NMPP. And yet, the Labour Party is the second minority party in this house, and none, nobody from the Labour Party has been asked to stand up. Mr. Speaker, I'm not protected. Mr. Speaker, let me hear. Mr. Speaker, I recognize you as the most fair-minded speaker. You don't discriminate, but it will appear that this debate has been hijacked by a certain political party denying all of us the opportunity to speak, Mr. Speaker, on an issue that cuts across all the six geopolitical zones. Mr. Speaker, I'm only begging and appealing to your fairness that we all know you, sir, that you call some NMPP and Labour to contribute to this debate, Mr. Speaker. I say, Which party are you, are you representing? I represent Labour Party, proudly. Uh, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, LMP 78, uh, LMP 79, <laughs> LMP 80. <laughs> Thank you, your point of order. My questions are, Mr. Speaker, Niger Republic recently withdrew from the Joint Tax Force, and if you could look, Niger Republic is a gateway for allowing these uh, arms into, from Libya down to Nigeria. I'm asking the service chief, what efforts will you put? Honorable Gary, come back, please. Come what back. efforts are you going to put in place 
to curtail this uh, issue of inflow of uh, this, this small arms. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, recently the federal government had agreed to bring in the to the Air Force the brand new Takono uh, aircraft. I would want to find out whether these aircraft are fully put into use because if they are full, if they are put into use, the bandits who are remaining who are staying in the forest would have been smoked out. So the Air Force, so, uh, Chief of Army, uh, the Chief of Army staff, and the Air Force, these are my questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, my questions are three. My first question goes to the Chief of Army staff. There were a lot of allegations that the allowances of your personnel are not being paid. As a result of that, they are demoralized. They are scandered. Some resigned. Some engaged in mutiny. What are you going to say about that? That's one. The second question goes to the Chief of Naval Staff. You may recall that between 2015 and 2016, a technology was deployed particularly to pilot to, sub, to give a surveillance in Nimbe Creek. And that was piloted by the, Niger, by the Naval Staffs as well as the National Security Advisor. And the SABA, I think, is still domiciled either in the Navy or in the office of the National Security Advisor. And uh, up to now, and that technology has the capacity to even monitor the tribal mark of the people committing that crime. And it has been abandoned. Is that deliberate? Well, secondly, uh, we have resulted in engaging private security to manage our pipelines. Does that indicate the failure of Chief of Naval Staffs? Well, that's two. Number three, my question goes to the CDS. With corresponding amount of money budgetary given to these services, what is the template or timeline do you have that Nigeria is going to be scared? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to ask um, our security chiefs what their thoughts are on integrating um, local vigilantes into the security architecture to be on the front line of response and also early warning uh, systems. Number two, Mr. Speaker, I had the privilege of serving on the NSAS panel for Ikiti State, and uh, we heard a lot of very grievous crimes that were committed by uniformed men. So I'd like to ask what your thoughts are, what your um, key learnings were from the NSAS experience, and also to ensure that we don't have such human rights violations further. And lastly, Mr. Speaker, as we know, we have extant legislation and policies that states that every um, Nigerian that is taken to a hospital, um, they owe the person the duty of immediate care and stabilization in emergencies. We want to be able to hear from our security chiefs very loud and clear that the issue of police reports is no longer required in hospitals before Nigerians are treated. We've had motions in this respect about uh, people like um, Greatness, the young lady that died in the Metama Hospital because of the issue of police report. So it would help for the hospitals to hear directly from you today before Parliament. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me to speak. Uh, it is uh, a matter which I discussed with the Army, who are under the Chief of Defense Staff, and he has mentioned a similar, a different thing from what I, was, I discussed with them in Makodi. And I wish to get some clarification. There has to be some clarification on, on the issue. Yes. And the issue is about... My brother, don't do what you are us. Your political border is overruled. <laughs> Please sit down. I want to ask the CDS, is there any plan to rejuvenate security operations in southern Kaduna especially Operation Safe Haven, which majorly operates in that area. Secondly, there's a very high demand for military-grade motorbikes. 
due to the terrain in southern Kaduna for security personnel to reach areas where there are troubles. I want to call on the CDS to please consider the plea of the military personnel when it comes to the supply of military-grade motorbikes. Thank you so much. Mr. Speaker, my question has to do with our legal frameworks. We have adjusted the Police Act. We have provided for other legislation that are meant to enhance the capacity of our own armed forces by way of establishing Honorable, please go straight to the question. We don't have to add for um, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Commentary. By way of establishing agencies under them. Mr. Speaker, we have community policing. Let me start with my friend, Honorable Maki. If we have community policing in the new police act, Nigerians will want to know how effective is community policing being implemented and how it has affected the security of the Nigerian people. Last question, Mr. Speaker. Looking at our... So your question is to Honorable uh, Maki, not to the IG. Is that what you are saying? So that we put it on record. I'm using synonyms, Mr. Speaker. I'm using synonyms. <laughs> Maybe I'm connecting to IG through Honorable Maki. Mr. Speaker, lastly... Through Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, our, the operation of our security system is coordinated. Having been chairman of Navy, I am aware of some of those things. But, sir, the present, some Nigerians, we are here to speak for Nigerians. Some Nigerians are clamoring for the explanation regarding to the responsibility of the internal security of the country. What effort is the security chief, including the Inspector General of Police, are putting together to ensure that our security operation is being championed, particularly the issue of internal security maintenance by the Nigerian police instead of the presence of the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Navy in the internal security activities of this country. If they can shed more light on that, it will add value to the understanding of the people of Nigeria. Thank you, sir. Point of order. IGP, my question of first instance goes to you. Sir, IGP, how soon will you promise Nigerians that the barracks in Nigeria will be habitable for your men? Because as you speak, it is a nice Men and women of Nigerian police that have retired before the civil war still occupies these barracks while the new ones that you are bringing in do not have a place to stay. That is why transferring from their homes to their points of duties has been so difficult. What are you going to do to make this place cease the barracks habitable and to be occupied by those that are meant to be fair. Number two, it seems the ammunition being paraded whenever criminals are arrested in Menugo, for instance, are the same thing, are the same ammunition that are being paraded in Lagos State, in Sokoto and Jigawa. It seems that this ammunition are so deep as well the same because Nigerians are wondering that if you load this ammunition were the real one that were arrested in the course of you arresting the uh, the, 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 the criminals that's that for, for you IGP and then for CDC please the two questions are enough please let me ask let you me know, so we have I will ask my questions, but I just, I just want to give a brief synopsis that the problem of today, security challenges today, Mr. Speaker, are in action or action as a result to the so many high number of out of school children that were not taken to school 30 years ago. Today they are the bandits, today they are the cattle wrestlers, today they are the Boko Harams. 
Today they are the only three children that are devastating every aspect of our country, social strata and sector. So my question is to the chair and staff. The chair and staff, for 10 years or more, we have observed that the operational strategy particularly has been to repel attacks. The days of these bandits are well known and marked. What is the cake or the bottleneck? What, what are the Mama, traditional institutions? Please be attentive. What are the challenges preventing the new, newly appointed chairman? Traditional institution, please be at, be attentive. <laughs> What are the challenges preventing you from taking this war to the doorsteps of these bandits? Bushes had been a home for them, so they are comfortable there. In as much as you didn't pursue them, they feel comfortable staying there. Honorable Abuja, are you lecturing or you are asking questions? Please go straight and ask your question. Now, why, why, or how do you intend to improve on your current tactics of repelling attacks rather than taking the war to the doorsteps of the bandits? What roadmap do you have? Because you have highlighted issues relating to manpower, resources, and whatever. For example, what what do you have in place that showcases what you require in manpower and resources within a particular time frame to need, to need the private security system or the security challenges to the board? And then finally, on the issue of proliferation of small, and, and, uh, small arms and ammunition, there have been uh, complaints and allegations of lack of synergy and collaboration between interagencies, uh, collaboration and synergies. How do you intend to improve on this? On uh, the issue of uh, oil theft, the issue of oil theft, which is another security challenge that is affecting even financing the security agencies to discharge their position of responsibility. The two honorable staff, you have installed the Falcon Eye which I had the privilege of being taken through it and have seen how effective it is. Why is it that we still have the problem of oil theft in the country? And that why do we still have the challenge of having um, 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 uh, still struggling to meet up with our upper quota of production? Uh, my speaker, my question goes to the Chief of Defense Staff. The Chief of Defense Staff, in his presentation, was making uh, this uh, uh, one of the challenges that, uh, that is uh, the cost of importation of small arms and ammunition. My question is uh, what is the defense, uh, this is the headquarters, and uh, Minister of Defense doing about the utilization? of Defense Industries Corporation in Kaduna that is meant for this, uh, uh, this manufacture of large small arms and also ammunition. And the other question, uh, the chief of, uh, goes to, still to the Chief of Defense Staff. On this issue of uh, uh, this uh, equipment and armament, the Chief was saying that at least in every battalion, you will need at least 88 APCs. Yes, that is, uh, uh, this is a large amount of money it will have to go for the purchase of this equipment. But my question is, uh, why don't the defense, uh, this is the headquarters, look at it in a such a way that at least in every budget three year, they should be able to at least equip at least a company in every uh, infantry brigade and also uh, this is a company in every uh, armor brigade, also a battery 
in every artillery brigade. I think when we start this way, uh, at least it will be a good uh, at least our start. Uh, sir, my will be will not be in form of a question, but just a little analysis. Uh, I want to say kudos to all our military men. You do a great job, and we appreciate you. I was part of you, and I'm still part of you. Uh, but uh, most of um, my analysis, I mean analysis this afternoon is the fact that uh, for us to fight a surgency or banditry, we must first of all identify the center of gravity of the enemies. And uh, if you remember the wordings, uh, if you remember the wordings, uh, without you knowing the center of gravity of the enemy, it's going to be difficult for us to be able to win this war. And on a serious note, we'll be fighting this war since 2009. And uh, we cannot say we are really winning. If you have to reference the reality, we can't say we are really winning. And I can say that from all analysis we'll be doing before now, we all know we are aware that the center of gravity of this enemy is the source of funding. Without, this, without us stopping the source of funding, it's going to be difficult for us to fight this war. Because when there is something fanning the smoke, the fire will continue to burn. And uh, the question I want to ask you this afternoon is the fact that, uh, CDS, sir, I want to know if you have any way that these uh, honorable members here can help you or help the system to be able to stop the source of funding of this insurgency so that what happened in Bangladesh and some other country can also happen in Nigeria. Then we can be able to win this war timely and efficiently in a manner that every Nigeria will appreciate. Thank you very much. My question is very short and brief. Um, I want to be very particular about the integrity of the intelligence unit of the police, Nigeria police. And this comes to my mind as a result of most of the crimes that have taken place in this country. Ordinary man sometimes are aware that there's going to be that criminal and criminalities activity. So it takes the police, the Nigeria police hours to know that, yes, such operation is going to take place. And instances are bound that when such operations are still taking place, you will never see police or any of the armed forces to counter such attacks. Honorable please ask your questions. Yes, that is the integrity of the ask your questions leader the integrity of the intelligence of the police force that's where i am how yeah. effective is their intelligence unit okay that's my question sir. mr speaker i thank you very much for giving me this opportunity what i actually wanted to say my colleague one of my colleagues has said it but i just want to add uh, that about the police barracks the police barracks are so, so inhuman. They are horrible. They are horrible. So I want to know from the Commissioner of Police, Inspector of Police, IG, what he's going to do about the police barracks. Because we have our children there and they are growing. Hmm? They are growing in such an environment is not healthy. I hereby rest my case and Mr. Speaker, thank you once again. Let me just go straight to the point. Uh, I just want uh, the CDS and the Chief Army staff to give us more light about last month that the uh, uh, issue of dialogue that came off in Katsina and some part of Zampara State. And uh, to our surprise, we saw the military in the video that is going around. But uh, Defense Minister Abakar Abadawu, he said that the uh, federal government is not in any way engaging or participating in dialogue in any part of the country.
But our surprise, we saw the military there. They participated in the dialogue in both Katsina and Zamfara State. So for that, uh, we are confused because the minister denied engaging or involving in any dialogue in any part of the country with the bandit. Number two, uh, Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, I just want to ask the Chair of Army staff, in most instances, you can see there is public outcry in some places regarding the personnel that are posted in a particular area. So in the discharge of their duties, the people of that community, they raise alarm about the way they conducted their uh, services there, would bring about suspicion. So after that public outcry, you can see the military or the people responsible for their transfer or deployment. The moment they do that transfer to them, you can see the community regain a sense of peace and stability. It happened in Kaurana local government in Kaurana Moda. Because there are incessant attacks in Kaura almost day in, day out. But when the public outcry becomes so premium, then they transfer the officer there. After they transfer him, then there's a little bit uh, listen in the area. So we need to shed more light on that one. We are taking notes of the questions. If the questions are too many, they won't be able to answer them effectively. Uh, so, all the police with their account permission, we'll put a seal to the questions for now. We already informed them that this is going to be a continuous exercise. Every quarter, we will engage them so that they can give us a progress report. So, for those of you who have not been able to ask questions, please wait for the next time. We will give you priority when we um, identify people to ask questions. And uh, secondly, honorable colleagues, with your kind permission, I can see some of the questions are quite sensitive. Uh, there are probably no questions that um, our uh, invited guests will be able to conveniently answer openly. So we will go into executive session for all the answers so that uh, we give them all the opportunity to talk freely and to tell us transparently what uh, all the questions that we have asked. So, so with your kind permission, I will call on the leader to move that the House resolve to executive session. Those in support of this motion should say aye. aye. Those against should say nay. The ayes have it. I will resolve to executive session. To the chiefs who are in charge of our various services, that consigns our security as a nation. We must start by saying we are proud of you. We must start by thanking the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for taking the decision of choosing those who are experienced, who are intelligent officers. Mr. President, observe the gap between the communication among the agencies and he chose a set that understands each other, that's cooled with one another. It makes communication easy, it makes networking easy, it makes sharing of intelligence easy. Little wonder it is getting better by the day. It is one day at a time we are not yet there, but there is definitely a strong hope that we will be there with this renewed hope agenda of Mr. President, which you have reflected very well in the way and the manner you address the concerns of Nigerians through their various representatives. For what is democracy without the parliament? The parliament remains the fulcrum of our democracy. What is democracy without the people? And what is the people in democracy without engagement? What we have done today is part of the principles of democracy, public engagement. We are the people sees this place as the people's house. 
where interactions are held, not just for investigation. You were not investigated today. You were not put on the spot today. But we wanted to hear from you, and that we have heard so clearly. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being patient from morning till this time. Thank you for being very comprehensive in your analysis of issues presented before you. You were thorough, and we are so impressed. And this is my way of saying thank you to Mr. Speaker for this initiative of yours. For us to involve in this sectorial engagement periodically with the various sectors of our economy. But there was no other place to have started to have been the best to start this than the security, because that is the yearning of everyone. I'm happy that when we wanted to meet with finance, it was not possible that day that security took over. We are so happy that the Nigerians who believe that this was the burning issue in their heart, by the time they see the report of what we have done today, they will be so impressed that we have security chiefs who are not just chiefs, but servants of the people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for taking this decision. And I want to thank the leadership of the House for supporting Mr. Speaker in this initiative, in line with the legislative agenda. And I want to thank you members, most distinguished colleagues, who have waited from morning till now, who showed yourself competent with relevant questions. Gone are the days when people in the parliament are treated with disdain, as if they are ones who mistakenly found themselves in the people's house, the parliament. You have shown intelligence in the way you analyze the security situations of the country. You have shown intelligence in the way you presented it before the security chief. You have also shown respect in the way and manner you carried yourself and your dignity and the dignity of this house by the way you presented your question. Thank you very much. This is a signal to those whom we have invited that certainly when you come here to engage with us, you are going to be respected. As well, we are also assured that we are going to be respected. Thank you very much. And to Nigerians who believe in the parliament for this kind of engagement, and some of you who send your questions, we are so proud of you. When the next sectorial engagement calls, please be part of it. Send your question. Thank you, and God bless the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So let's say the, major, the acting whip to please lead our chiefs out of the uh, chamber. Thank you very much for coming. God bless you all. Leader, you have, uh, let, let the whip lead them out. Thank you, thank you very much. We are grateful. Thank you. Is this overtaking? Hmm? It's overtaking.